Uh, hey, Eric. I can't hear you. You're muted. Oh, hi, Jerry. Um, hey. Yeah, I have some time today, and Stacey has been telling me about these calls, so I figured I'd join. Excellent. Um, so I don't know if you know this, and I'll clip it off as I probably should, but this this particular call, just the Thursday call, automatically starts recording when the first person shows up. Yeah, I saw that. And you were just screen sharing, and yeah, and, but you were talking on mute. So yeah, I'm that's gonna... fine. Okay, uh, you could clip it out. Uh, it's just <laughs> I was just experimenting. Uh, what okay. I was what I was sharing was a Ted Nelson zigzag database system. I don't know awesome. if anyone heard. Yeah, the presentation looked like it was old Apple graphics. I'm like, that's really interesting. It's old <laughs> Apple graphics. It's uh, yeah on a Mac. Um, do you want to put it? Do you want to put it back on screen for a sec? Yeah, well, um, I'll wait for other people to join. If you want to bring me in at a certain point in the call to do it, I can. That sounds great. We'll do it in the in the checkout in the check in rhythm. Okay, sure. Checkout being something else entirely. <laughs> okay. Hey, Stacy. Hey, Craig. Hello. Hi, guys. Greetings. Uh, oh shit! So I just rem I just realized I missed you completely completely yesterday. I didn't think of it. I meant to I meant I meant to have a go at the the Wednesday uh, uh, gatherings. Oh shit! Well, uh, Stacey and I had a very good strategic session. Mm. Excellent. Glad to hear it. Uh, where'd, where'd that word come from? Strategic. That, that would be no W. It's a it's George a, it's W. A, oh yeah, George W. It's yeah. a W malapropism. Yes. It's like it's like <laughs> putting food on your family. I remember now. <laughs> food on your family that i hadn't heard <laughs> oh it's a good one there's, there's a whole side of there's a whole side okay <laughs> yeah they know there's bushisms uh-huh you were gonna say something oh you put a link up uh -huh. yeah it, i was concentrating on how to do it <laughs> excellent um it fits into what we were talking about yesterday it was an article in forbes featuring these five women economists oh good and uh I didn't get to re I didn't get to read the whole thing, but I had listened to a YouTube video that I actually posted, I think, in GCC about one of the women, and it was building the case for capitalists of why they would want to stop climate change, and you know. So I found I, I definitely want to look into those women, which is kind of what we were talking about. Thank you. I've got a bunch on each of them in my brain. So what I'll do is okay. I will add that link, and then I'll add the different economists <clears throat> to the story so they're easy to find from the story and then i'll add the forbes article to the call today this uh the hey, call instance so <coughs> excuse me it's uh links all the way down hey klaus good morning good morning um i'll wait one more second i'm gonna start up a, a thought for today's call in my brain yeah, the last the last article I was reading before sort of joining this call was about um, AI killer robots. Like uh, the next the next uh, revolution in military affairs is <clears throat> basically autonomous lethal things. And it's like, oh, good, that's science. Bad science fiction movies are closer to us than we think. Can they just do it all off the planet, maybe on the moon somewhere. Let them that kill would each be other. lovely. Yeah, that would, that would be really lovely. And <laughs> yeah, hey Pete. Um, so why don't we start in on our normal rhythm, um, and why don't we go uh, Craig, Eric, Stacy? Yeah, hi, just checking. I'm not muted. You are just uh, fine. We are coming through five by five, as they say in the radio world. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, no, I got a message here about low system resources. I've had far too many things open, so I spent the last few minutes closing things, and I just wondered if I had muted myself. Yeah, um, I've had a great week. I got my second uh, Pfizer shot on Tuesday. And along with the, the other expats, we were all at the local hospital to, uh, this is uh, free shots from the government, which has surprised and pleased us all greatly. And along with the others, we all shared that common feeling, having gotten the second shot. <laughs> It's so relieving and uplifting. The cloud is uh, is dissipating, and uh, we're looking forward to to getting out again. And then the news came through that uh, my daughter, who's thirteen, along with uh, all other teenage school kids, are going to get two Pfizer shots during the month of uh, October. Wow! 
Well done. Well done, Thailand. Deci decided in Thailand, yes. Yeah. So the schools can open uh, first week in uh, November. She's been at home for five or six months now. Pretty awful, really. She's handling it very well, but uh, there's there's nothing like going to school, is there? And, and all the social life around that and everything too. So, so that's all been uplifting. And in my work, I'm so excited and pleased. I've uh, I discovered a way of packaging. Uh, an enhanced website. By enhanced website, I mean a progressive uh, web app, which is a website with a, a service worker that makes it do things that no ordinary websites can't do. You can package those up and create app bundles, which you upload to Google Play and to the Microsoft Store and get listed there using an absolutely super tool created by Microsoft called a PWA Builder. And I did that this week and I've got both my main products now listed in both stores. So, yay! Hey. <laughs> it's been an exhilarating week. I'm very pleased. That sounds awesome. Love that. Mm. Um, it's funny, uh, the second vaccine psychology is really interesting because I, I remember early in pandemic realizing that I was treating the outside world like um, Matt Damon in the movie, The Martian. Like every, every, every walk outside was like an EVA and anything could kill you, <laughs> Yeah. right? And yeah. you just had to be really careful about everything. And then you kind of right, get used yeah. to it and so forth. But, but at, at, you know, at second vaccine, you're like, oh, okay. So the lethality of everything out there, like things could, things could bite me, but they're not likely to kill me now. So that's right, really interesting. Yeah. Mm, and, yeah, that and, is a nice. And Pete, I don't know from your streaming on the emergent event sense making. Have you been hitting a lot of stuff about the psychology of of the moment? Um, which uh, which moment? <laughs> um, so Delta, uh, basically the the Delta wave and and all of that because there's I think there's like a particular psychology of this wave because we're. We're kind of jaded, anxious, tired, uh, overstressed. Uh, a lot of people have loosened their own protocols for what to do. Um, there's the politics are just as bad as ever. You know, all all that kind of stuff. Yeah. The uh, so our data collection has been mostly it, it's largely U.S. Um, so you know, it's a particular shape of the wave, particular uh, delta delta phase. Uh, different countries go through it at different times. Um, I, all of the things that you just mentioned, um, another thing I would add is, uh, you can see some of the, the, the real anti-vax people kind of shifting, um, uh, the, we had a, a decent number of stories about, you know, going to an, an ICU and it's completely full of COVID patients. Um, and most of them are regretful, um, you know, that they're very sick and that they didn't have the vaccine when they, when they could have. Um, uh, another little blip is the anti-vax radio hosts uh, dying. Uh, so we're up to six or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. people who were rab rapidly anti-vax and, and spreading that and, and now they're dead. Um, uh, so that was, it was it's interesting to watch that kind of in the, in the news, how that gets covered and, and what that, what people think about it. Mostly a lot of kind of disappointment, a lot of fatigue from the healthcare system, um, mm -hmm. the, the people working in the healthcare system. <clears throat> they're getting, um, you know, they get kind of both ends of it. They feel uh, like their um, their their company isn't protecting them very well. Um, they're they're overworked um, and underpaid and understaffed, um, and then they get a lot of patients who don't really need to be there, who, who, who could have avoided being there just by getting a vaccine, but who decided not to. And then some of those are, are uh, some of those folks are very, um, uh, very angry and, and not all of them, some of the, some of them are kind of repentant, but, but some of them are very angry and it's like your fault that I'm in the hospital. It's your fault that you're not giving me ivermectin. It's your fault that I can't breathe. It's, you know, um, and they still have to kind of take care of these folks and then watch other folks who, you know, have heart problems or need, emer you know, emergency surgery. Mm -hmm. can't get into the ICU because it's full of COVID patients. So, yeah, yeah. 
and, and I think I think there's a few of the a few of the skeptic denier types who die not wanting ever to think that they died of COVID, and like yeah. the doctor's like you're dying of COVID, and it's like fuck you, like yeah, you know, no, not, no, no, I'm I'm, not. no, I'm not. Right. You you gave me bad care. Right. Exactly. So it's it's a mess. Uh, another thing I happen to know, I, Wendy Elford and I talk every week, and so um, they're obviously in a different phase. They're just getting their first vaccines, um, you know, and uh, they've they've had a lot of strict quarantining in different states. Um, and when, Wendy's in Wendy's in Australia. Uh, she's in uh, New South Wales. She's mm -hmm. in um, Canberra, um, which is between Melbourne and Sydney, um, and she's got you know friends and and stuff around. So. Um, uh, they're pretty good at doing the quarantine. They're um, they don't have the political um, polarization around vaccination. Um, and the, the the striking thing is that unlike countries like Israel or the U.S., um, Israel and U.S. have lots of um, ICU and emergency room capacity because we have lots of violence and gunshots and things like that. Um, uh, Australia has many fewer um, uh, ICU beds per thousand um and they're they're pretty scared about it both both sides of the political aisle are you know it's like we can't afford to like fill up those beds and uh attrit our our healthcare workers because you know we're too small of a country to do that and we're, they don't, we're they don't have the damper for that yeah and i had not had that thought that you just said for which sort of bittersweet thank you which is that we have many more icu cases because we have so much violence yeah that it's I had not, thing. I had not realized that. So it gives us this buffer capacity at pandemic times. Yeah, Mark is, is that's the proper the proper gesture for for that thought. It's crazy, and all of this is remind, reminding me that, um, like the Viet, I think it was the Vietnam War where you figured this out. The golden hour uh, for gunshot wounds and for battle wounds. Like like if you can get somebody into care within the hour, stop their bleeding, and keep them from dying within the hour. The, the the fatality rate go, rate goes way down, and and so we get wars like Vietnam, where many more people came home badly, badly injured, and in and in Iraq and Afghanistan, we figured out how to patch people together who would have died in previous wars. Just simply yeah. would have we would never have been able to save them. So, and so there, there, there are many more. Ran. They, yeah, they so, lost limbs, but they didn't die. Right. And, yeah, well, um, even severe mental, severe brain injuries, whatever, but yeah. still we saved them. Yeah. The. Um, uh, that works for strokes and heart attacks too, um, yeah. uh, if you get uh, quick care. And then, of course, uh, we've we've gotten now so that if you've got a stroke or a heart attack or something like that, and you um, show up at the emergency room, you may or may not get treated. Right. Exactly. Um, my mom had a stroke uh, last December, and the first question from from care was, "When was the stroke?" Because there's a four-hour window to administer something that will help a lot, but outside the four-hour window, it doesn't help at all. It might hurt. So, and we didn't know exactly when it happened, so it was not administered. So, there we go. Anyway, thank you, um, uh, Stacy Eric Kals. And Stacy, it turns out that the article you just pointed to in Forbes, I'm just going to screen share for a sec. Um, I already had it in my brain from uh, where it was published, I think, before Forbes. So. I've connected it to the link for today's call, but here's Mariana Matsukato, Stephanie Kelton, Esther Duflo, Kate Reworth, and Carlotta Paris. Um, and then connected to reimagining capitalism in a world on fire, et cetera, et cetera. But over to you in the booth. Um, yeah, so I had a nice call with you, Jerry, yesterday. And I'm guessing you're like me where I got up and now I have all these different ideas. <laughs> and I'm like, well, maybe I should shape it this way or which is the best way that never happens to me, Stacey. I am like, <laughs> I am iron solid on a path and I just stick to that path. I knew you would understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but what was nice is after the call, the things that I came across, like this article or a video I watched, just confirmed, yeah, I'm on the right track. Because this, you know, it's coming after the fact. I didn't see it before. It's coming now. So that was nice. Um, I have a little bit of a headache now, which has slowed me down from further reading or doing more. And uh, I'm happy to be here because I really do feel that it's the social weaving that's the missing piece. And with that, I just want to say, I don't know Ingrid, but nice to have you here. And I don't know if you guys know her. <laughs> we do. Okay. <laughs> um, cool. And I also want to report in, I had a lovely conversation with, uh, with Judy Benham yesterday, oh, who um, 
and I wrote this in the Mattermost, but I figured I'd report it back in generally. She had carpal tunnel surgery on her dominant right hand like over a month ago and underestimated how that was going to sort of knock her out and in particular knock her off of keyboarding mm -hmm. and all such things, but it's been kind of a welcome respite in some sense. Um, so she's doing fine and sends her love and uh, yeah. So that, that was good. I was worried that we hadn't sort of heard from her for a long time. Um, uh, Eric, do you want to go back yeah. and show what- the, Well, I want to you... talk a little first. Excellent, sounds great. Yeah, hi everybody, I'm Eric Rangel. I'm a friend of Stacy, and I know Jerry from the Digital Life Collective. So, um, and just a comment, I was trying to find the link naturally by searching and I couldn't find the Zoom link. I had to email Stacy. So if there's an easier way to post these somewhere for people searching, it would be a good idea. Uh, so it sounds like you might not be on the OGM mailing list because I sent that you a might reminder. Be it. Okay, so I'll, I'll make sure you're yeah. on that. Okay, thank you. So um, I live in Pennsylvania. I work in IT full time. Um, so, but I've been interested um, yeah, since I got into dig life and started exploring other social networks, uh, Zoom calls. Um, yeah, I've been interested in other technologies and, and people who are working on them. Now, um, what's interesting when I look back, the experience in learning Zoom became valuable for these times. Like the time that I spent being on calls and seeing what you could do with Zoom, I actually helped my synagogue with hybrid services and I've become a key person to point out things. For example, the spotlight the rabbi <laughs> so people can see okay. him. Not just, yeah. Does that make you a Xanter? Yeah, I guess, uh, whatever. Yeah, there's all kinds of Z words these days. I'm just saying. It's not uh, the canter only. Well, well there's a, a word called gabai, so a zabai, maybe. <laughs> yeah, okay. I like it. Yep. So um, now, today is a Jewish holiday, and uh, I have flexibility. I could tune into Zoom services later and uh, be part of the group, but... I could also enrich myself. And for me, being isolated so much, it's important for me to get out. And uh, I'll be um, actually doing an exhibit on, uh, next Saturday in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, at a guy who owns a retro computer museum store. It's really cool. He he's been collecting all these old, all this old equipment, and he organizes it. And uh, there's gift shops. They make unique photo cards of old computer uh, ads. <laughs> it's pretty cool stuff. So, um, OK. So one interest I have, uh, and what I'm going to be exhibiting on, is uh, Ted Nelson his work and um, what his concepts are. So earlier I was testing a screen share of his zigzag database system. I don't want to do it now. I'd rather have everybody check in and maybe at the end of the call I could share a little about it. But um, I'm going to be demonstrating um, his word processor Jot. He had the original concept of what a word processor should be. And so he, if you after soccer, I'm sorry, Al yeah. Allison, if you can hear us, could you mute your mic? Oh, sorry. That's, no worries. We're just overhearing your conversation. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, thanks. So see, Ted Nelson, he had to design things the way he wanted to. He figured out which combinations of keys would make a word processor work the way he wanted to, where it's easy to move a paragraph, easy to move a sentence. And uh, and I could demonstrate that on an Apple computer next next week, and people can come up and play with it. And I also have uh, Jeff Raskin's um, Swift system, which um, is his... Um, it became the Canon Cat, if anybody remembers that, <laughs> uh, which was only sold for six months. But he had the original ideas and the patent for that. So I was able to use that patent to resurrect the code and get it running on an Apple. And I could demonstrate that to, uh, now. Um, yeah. If you want it, I'm going to share screen yeah. for just a second. Because here's Raskin. Yeah. Who is very famous and died young, unfortunately. Yeah, I know. Um, and I don't think I have Swift or the Canon or the Canon Cat. Yeah, Canon Cat and SWYFT is the name of it. Uh, Canon C A T or K A T? It, cat, like uh, the animal. With the animal, okay. I don't have that. And SWYFT. Okay, 
I'll send you a I got stuff to look up. This is terrible. I feel, I'm, I'm, I feel, I feel naked here. You, you've exposed me. Yeah, so I will send you a YouTube that I did uh, for a Kansas Fest presentation. That's an annual meeting of Apple enthusiasts uh, where I talked about the cat and Jeff Raskin's work. So it's on YouTube. Actually, if you search for my name on YouTube, I have a whole channel and uh, presentations and stuff. So COVID has made me into a video producer accidentally. <laughs> and uh, I like to just really just express myself without too much editing and really like try to use all, everything I can for communication, like the subtitles or whatever I can do in my presentations to really get to the point, not bore people with uh, all this patter and filler. So, yeah. And so I'd love to see things happen, like these visions that Ted had uh, and Jeff come to life again because we're living in information overworld and your brain is one way, it's one approach, um, but Ted envisioned a whole global network which would have really helped because you'd have links to every source and you could follow transclusions where the same material is quoted in different documents and he had a, a system for indexing it all and it just never got anywhere because uh, like uh, Netscape and all the the way the history of computers uh, yeah the browser and Xerox Park uh, designs so his designs uh, they were they couldn't compete but he was ahead of his time so I'd love to talk with anybody who's interested in about these and, and you're mentioning sort of some of the patron saints of OGM in a sense, you know, Ted yep. Nelson, Doug Engelbart, mm -hmm. uh, Ben Iver Bush, a bunch of other people oh, yeah. who've had these visions of what information might look like. Mm -hmm. um, and some of us have met some of these people. Uh, I met, my, Ben Iver Bush died before I think any of us were born, yeah. but I've met Nelson and Engelbart and I'll just screen, I'll screen share um, Nelson here. Yep. But a, a, lot of the, a lot of these people had br brilliant visions and then were stuck by being stuck to their visions kind of. Um, and I had a, uh, he, there's this thing called Project Xanadu that, uh, mm -hmm. got, that got started out of Nelson's vision to try to play out the hypertext uh, system right. that he wanted. And I visit one of my first, one of my first articles about this kind of stuff as a tech analyst a long time ago was to visit Project Xanadu in Palo Alto. Oh, wow. Uh, and Roger Gregory was oh, their wonderful. CEO. And, and Gregory was like the geekiest geek I've ever met to this it's day. It's amazing, yeah. It, it's, actually, it's actually sort of sad to shoot the, 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 the biggest one really early. But, but uh, anyway, long description. But I wrote an article about Xanadu. And in the article back a very long time ago, nice. Um, I said, uh, Xanadu will be out in two years. <laughs> and this might have been 25 years ago. Um, and well, then they, they kept changing the date. They said XU88. It'll be out in 88. Back in 79, they said that. <laughs> and, then, and then imagine my surprise. It might be this article, Bite on Xanadu's launch. Or I don't remember which mm -hmm. one, but imagine my surprise to read an article five or six years ago about Project Xanadu saying mm -hmm. they're going to be out in two years. Yeah. Uh, so I, so I, I, I wish that there was a way to get more of these ideas in the world actually usably and usefully, right? Yeah. And if, and if Yuri were on this call, he knows more about transclusion than. Oh, sure. Than most of us, um, but I, it would be nice to have a conversation for how those features get boiled into yeah. every tool. So what we have are demos. Like uh, you can run a Windows demo, a Mac demo, and see his ideas in a limited sense. Um, my vision is to can this be brought forward into today's like virtual worlds and but in 3D. Like just even on a computer screen where you can navigate in 3D using the orthogonal structures that he proposed. Sweet. Um, Pete, what's the best channel for some of this? Are you on our Mattermost server as well? The um, Pete's Mattermost um, I, server? I haven't been on for a while, so um, I, I may be on there, but uh, I, just send me the new links and I'll sign up if I'm not. I'm just wondering what channel is the best one for this kind of conversation about uh, history, future, uh, hypertext, and all that. The, the best one is probably uh, tools and technology, um, yeah. although you could get some interest in, in the Flotilla channel um, and maybe even Massive Wiki. Cool. Could, could maybe use a, another channel for tools and technology is actually pretty close. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we could have a retro computing thing or a you know, knowledge system thing that we don't, don't yeah.
That sounds yeah. great. Let, let, let's use that one and, and just post a few things and see who's interested between calls, between our yeah. Thursday calls and see what's up. So someone new essentially here, I do feel overwhelmed, overloaded with all the things that you're doing and trying to move forward. And how do I get oriented is a question. Where do I start and where do I contribute? So these will come out of uh, as we work. Yeah. Thank you. Everybody who feels similarly, please like jazz hands. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Nobody? Everybody's comfortable Everybody who oriented? doesn't, uh, come join me on Matrix and check it out. Yeah, yeah. Wow, cool. I'm, okay. I'm kidding. Don't come join me on Matrix. Unless, you, <laughs> unless you're driven to. So, Eric, thank you. Uh, and sure. we'll, we'll, at the end of the call, we'll come back to our yep. person's screen share. That'd be great. Um, Klaus, John, Mark. Uh, and I mean Mark Thibault. Yeah, <clears throat> coming back to the uh, vaccination mess. Um, you have to ask the question, is there some logic to this madness? And there absolutely is, because Congress is in the middle of the reconciliation bill, which is completely dropped off the public's uh, attention. And it's uh, hard and heavy uh, what, is, what is being negotiated there. I was in a meeting invited yesterday representing business climate leaders with Senator Merkel, uh, uh, some, sorry, with Senator Biden, and uh, several other members of Congress uh, regarding the, uh, the carbon tax that is under discussion as part of funding uh, this bill. Of course, we that's our mission you know, is carbon fee and dividend. And the big conversation is then should we include uh, fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer from uh, the bill, right? Which of course for the commodity growers is uh, extremely important. Um, which of course for the uh, regenerative movement is extremely important to not uh, exclude fertilizer because it, it, is, it is making a, a horrible mess uh, in the environment. And it's basically the lifeblood of, of uh, uh, row crop farming, right? You can't grow uh, a monocrop without synthetic fertilizer, which is made from natural gas and tons of pesticides made from oil. So we want the carbon tax applied to uh, to uh, farm in fossil fuel farm inputs. So that, those are big fights going on right now, and the public is completely left out of the conversation. Even within the NGO network that I'm linked up with, um, they're not really conscious of of what is happening there. So this is this this whole conversation there. This is like abortion and. Uh, now it's vaccinations. This is like this proverbial red flag that's put, that the bull charges into. You know? um, so we are we are uh, in an interesting position with Citizen Climate Lobby because I'm coming out with this webinar. Uh, I'm just going to post it again here. So we are we are going to exceed 1,000 registrations today, and we have five more days to go. So we'll probably hit 13, 1,400 people. And these are, these are professionals. I mean, this is all from LinkedIn. Uh, these are NGO leadership. This is uh, congressional offices. And we're talking about uh, decentralizing agriculture, basically. Uh, now we're talking about getting out of uh, chemically focused farming. Um, but then we also have a webinar scheduled for December that's focused on commodity cores. Now. And the topic will there will be uh, um, will be uh, uh, alignment uh, more. It's not changing, but it is uh, climate uh, adjustments uh, uh, focused. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's a really interesting time. You know? And, and uh, uh, the, the pan, I have, I'm, I'm having discussions with our panel. We, we are going to script the conversation. You know, it's, this is not uh, uh, some random uh, talk. You no, know, we, we are very, we are aligning the conversation. So it's like a Disney movie, you know, we're scripting the conversation. Uh, so because we want, to tell, we want to create a story. The story is from uh, the needs of the farmer uh, to the, the, the needs of the farmer to, I mean, for, for, for what the farmer needs to be doing to restore his soil back to health to what the markets need to do to accommodate the farmer in this transition. Um, and, and I posted yesterday on, on, uh, on our open channel, I mean, I was really excited about uh, seeing 
seeing this uh, group show up uh, to our Jewish friends here. I mean, when, when my, you know, my, my daughter married uh, a boy from Tel Aviv, and when I was over in uh, in Israel visiting her, uh, my, my son-in-law's uh, uncle is actually working uh, for an agricultural company, and they're consulting uh, uh, overseas uh, in Africa, but primarily on on uh, agricultural installations. I mean, the Israelis are cutting edge when it comes to agriculture. Absolutely right. Um, and to see now that you know it's great what you have done in Israel, but you know all your neighbors are basically starting to run out of water, starving, you know, and creating massive dislocations of millions of people because you know Syria basically the mess in Syria started because the farmers ran out of water and and couldn't grow food anymore. So. Um, this is now, uh, when you listen in on these wonderful conversations here, there is now a recognition that food is intricately linked to the health of the entire planet, you know, to our climate, uh, to our the ecosystem, uh, uh, biodiversity. Uh, to so our politics. And, and, and uh, geopolitics, because food is, is politics, absolutely. Yeah. And so rather than starving some people uh, into submission, maybe we should uh, help them call their own food so they stay peaceful and worry about their own things. Yeah. So anyhow, um, yeah, so that's, uh, uh, that's my, my focus right now. It's really zooming in on this, on this webinar and, and, and uh, doing final touches on, on shaping the story we would like to tell. That sounds great, Klaus. Thank you. Um, let's go, John, Allison, Pete. Good morning. Um, so the last couple of weeks, actually, uh, people that I have some responsibility for have their, their medical intervention needs have escalated. And that has meant that I've had to spend a lot of time dealing with that. Uh, it's kind of taken me away from things like the topics we discuss and things that I would like to rather be spending my time on. But just to uh, bring it back to this conversation, um, I too, Jerry, you probably knew him better than I did, but I've had several conversations with Ted Nelson. Uh, and uh, it would be really interesting to say what parts of that vision, to, to rank, rank the parts of the vision in terms of their attainability with existing or projected future technology, number one, and then number two, an interest that would might be an OGM interest, certainly be my interest, is which, if any, of the Ted Nelson visions would help counteract uh, disinformation. Um, I, just off the top, they wouldn't. I mean, you know, you need it's a combination of the tool plus the the policy, the tool plus the design. You know, but and we don't really have the design because we don't really have the tool. We don't have the fluency yet in the, in the use of the tool. But I, I just have this intuition that there's, there's something there. Or there might be something there. Yeah. Uh, and it, it would be worth the, uh, you know, worth the drilling into that. And um, so I'll, I'll stop there in terms of my uh, check in and uh, good luck and keep going. Uh, thank you, Eric. Please pick up. Yeah, I just want to comment on that. Um, I did a video where I walked through some ideas I had where I just drew out on paper. And um, I'll, it's on my YouTube channel as well. But um, I did think how sense making could be improved with um, Ted's ideas of uh, tumblers and having personal areas, which you can then share in a web of trust with groups of people. and build your sense making and have dis real good discussions with rich metadata for um, yeah, to see alternative points of view and for helping people to see other information that they may not find on their own. But it's outside. It has to be decentralized. And the decentralized web has technologies that if you start about 25 projects and make sure they all do what you want, you could get it done. <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. comment. 
but there's a there's a, this it's like awkward collage of things you need to do together to make it actually sort of work which which someone's gonna like smooth together into some easier to use offer right. but think. think about long term <clears throat> like say somebody sets that vision like by 2050 we'll have this system well can you do that? Can can that happen if you had a John F. Kennedy making that a goal? Or so? <laughs> exactly, um, right. Eric. I should I should put you together with a, a, a Belgian friend, Peter Hinson. I, mm -hmm. I put him in the chat earlier. He has a place. A place. He bought a church in a little town in Belgium mm -hmm. and con converted it into an apple chapel. And, <laughs> and the rose window over the door when you walk in is actually the Atari logo. Oh God! Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> Which is which is lovely, right? Yeah. And then you walk in, and there's like you know from the early Apple One, you know, yep. sort of from every like pretty much every model, the two E, the two whatever. Yeah, I sounds a, like my house. I have every early model. <laughs> well, you maybe want to talk to him because I don't know if you want to donate some things to him or whatnot. Uh, he's got a Lisa, of course, and oh all sure, that kind of stuff. I don't it have all that. It was lovely, and he cares. That's cool. He, yeah, there, he cares there's like you care, uh, like you care about the history of these things. I mean, there's lots of people who uh, they they start collecting all this stuff and then they can't figure out what to do with it uh, and where it should go exactly so, yeah so there are rescues that people do uh, garbage dumps to rescue things yeah okay that could that's another tangent there's all these tangents uh, there are yeah so, so mm -hmm. okay um and then pete you asked a good question uh like why didn't we why haven't we used you know built these technologies like uh, another Ted Nelson Doug Engelbach question why didn't we adopt their ideas and I'll, I'll give I'll give my own partial version of that which is we did adopt huge hunks of their technology, like win overlapping windows on a bitmap display with a mouse and all that kind of stuff is now standard fare. We're all sort of using this stuff. It completely came in. Um, and then hypertext is like the, the juice of the web, except for some of the details. And in particular, someone once wrote, and I, I don't remember where, that Steve Jobs gave us personal computing and then just didn't understand the interpersonal part of it. And, and Doug's system was, you know, the augmented learning system, but it was really about, about social, the social nature of thinking together. And nobody got that. So, so the, the superficial Windowsy stuff absolutely stuck and was carried through by Alan McKay and a bunch of others. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then we got stuck on the social. And it's, what's curious to me is like, why is the social and the connectedness part so difficult to get? Like, well, why is that so hard for, for, for people to understand? Then some, some other people understand it deeply. So, you know, networking starts in other places and now we, now we take the internet for, for granted. But uh, I heard at one point a story that Steve Jobs was walking through the cubicles and somebody, one of his engineers was working on something. He says, what's that? And he's like, well, I've got this networking thing where we could net to network together the, map, the Macs, you know, and you just hook them together with these little barrel connectors. And, and he says, no, you're not. Picks up this gear and throws it across the room. Yeah. Right. And, and like later you get Apple talk and, and, and whatnot, but don't know why those things happen. Right, go ahead, Eric. Here's just another comment. Um, so think about the key idea of letting the data exist in separation from the presentation. Now think about what you could do in a 3D virtual reality or augmented reality environment uh, with having access to the data structured with the rich metadata linking and that that Ted proposed. That's the where I see it, its potential. Okay. Um, which is its own longer tangent that, that I won't pick up right this second because the whole notion of 2D, 3D uh, all, and how they interact and, and exchange is like really rich as well. I'm mm -hmm. sorry, Julian's not on this call because he's, he's one of our stronger sort of 3D. Wait, Julian just joined the call as I said his name. Wow. That was eerie. Uh, <laughs> Hello, Julian, dropping in from outer space. That was brilliant. <laughs> um, Eric was just saying that that some of the places that that in, this interface stuff is going to go is into the third dimension and all of that, and you know, virtual spaces and so forth. And I was like, too bad Julian's not on the call because he click. So, somehow the audio got through. So. Yeah, exactly, exactly. It made it through the inner tubes, uh, the the ether tubes, or something like that. Um, how are you feeling? Uh, better. I'm cool. hoping, to, hoping to spend my day up to the neck in tech. Excellent. Uh, glad to see to, it. Didn't even mean to rhyme. So. That was good. You're a poet and you don't know it. Um, cool. Let, let's go back to our queue for a bit and go Allison, Pete, Mark, uh, Carranza. 
So it's you, Allison. Yeah. All right. Um, well, good morning from Northern California. And from, um, I am mostly unable to follow most of the conversation about tech. It's <laughs> really um, deeply into places that I'm unfamiliar with. Um, I do notice the, um, you know, we are a collective of uh, certain a certain demographic here, and. Um, and I, I just, I, I tend to um, notice how that directs our thinking and conversation and, and things like that about what information is valuable um, broadly. And of course, I'm just going to share, I guess. It, my, um, my passion has been for a long time on healing economic trauma. You know, I talk about that kind of stuff. And building and cultivating economic ecosystems and how do we share knowledge. There's this technology piece of it where I find in my other threads that are generally filled with um, techies, coders um, from all over the world, but mostly tend to be of the white male persuasion, right? Um, which is fine, it's been great people. And um, one of the things that comes up a lot is how much idealism there is in wanting to create systems that work for everybody, but that community is where it gets really, really challenging. You know, we're trying to create community, but God, people, God, people getting along, that's really where it's hard. You know? And I invite this consideration of, um, we can get to the moon when our brains work collectively towards a specific goal. And we can come up with so many different technologies and, and that it is absolutely a possibility to address the delicious challenges that we get from the charge that happens in our relationships between people and our differences in understanding and our differences in perspective, that that charge is like an atom, you know, it's like this ball of energy that's just waiting to engage with curiosity in order to release the potential that it has for a synergistic learning um, that, you know, always we are in relationship. And so when it comes to technology, just kind of like, I'm interested right there in this quality of our tech, our problem solving brains being applied to opening up that relational capacity that we have as humans to connect with one another, a sort of another frontier um, that isn't just brushed under the human side of, of tech. Um, and one of the things that actually strikes me with that is our problem solving abilities so quickly go towards, um, towards problem identification. And what in that is says something about ourselves and our own psychology and our own perspectives. And further, oftentimes in, the, in our laudable, heroic efforts to problem solve, we want to identify the source of the problem. And so oftentimes we get towards blame quickly. And in open global mind, I'm finding a continuous pattern of really trying to be open about where we find a myriad of intersecting crises that we feel need to be urgently addressed. And yet we look at the crises and we tend, and I, I am a little bit skeptical myself um, that we, in blaming others in any time, in any form, um, that, that, that we might need to check that. Where is there an inherent flaw in our open global thinking if um, we're automatically under the assumption that somebody is doing something wrong that's it. That's kind of that's kind of what I want to share. Thanks, Allison. Um, and that's a, a bunch of um, a bunch of different related important things. Um, we have struggled a lot with diversity here. We very much understand that we're mostly white men, 
uh, and, and heavily geeks. Um, Stacy, you you are like a phenomenal uh, trooper to hang in there with us and 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 ask good questions all the time. Uh, really appreciate that. And we have a on the Mattermost, we have a, a channel to try to address this. And my own approach to this has been not to hey let's rally everybody and mix up this set, you know let's make the Thursday calls really diverse, but rather to go out and try to be helpful to more diverse communities than than we have, than I am, than we are. And if by chance those people decide to come over here and, and join us, that would be great. But but if you're a person of color right now in the middle of Black Lives Matter and everything else that's going on in the world, you likely have more important things to do than maybe be on these calls. I don't know, but I would love to increase the diversity of these calls. It's just hard. And then second comment on the diversity and the geekiness of it, there's sort of OGM as a thesis has this yin yang soft hard side to it where the soft side is the, all the squishy stuff about trust and, and vulnerability and presencing and bridging the cultural divide and facilitation and all that. And we spend very little time there and the facilitators who've come through the conversation haven't hung out and stayed in the conversation that much. So um, black belt, you know, global facilitators like Nancy White are at the periphery listening in on us but, but she's not spending her time hanging out in here, which may be a function of what we're choosing to talk about entirely. So I'm, I'm, I'm alert to that. I'm trying to figure that one out. Uh, but also a lot of the things we're trying to chew on in some of the sub su subsidiary calls uh, in OGM, like Monday's Free Jerry's Brain Calls or the Build OGM Calls, there's a lot of geeky stuff we're just trying to puzzle through and figure out. Like, uh, like the question that Eric put uh, put forth a moment ago, which is, what if we separated the data from the tools? That is a huge thing for us, and we're actually trying to work on that, Eric, actively. Like that's a that's a really important thing. Pete uh, is building massive wiki on top of Markdown files, all of which is too geeky for for the point being made here. But he's doing that on purpose to solve that problem. So so I think that the many people here interested in these things are interested in chewing on some of the geeky things. Go ahead, Alison. Yeah, and in no way did I mean to, I was just saying, like, really couldn't contribute to what had been said. And, and I didn't mean it as a criticism in any way, because I am jumping into a conversation that was far precedes me. Um, and yeah. actually super rich and educational and wonderful and all of that stuff, which is why I show up. Uh -huh. and, and I'm not, um, I'm, I'm listening with care because I really want our conversations to be useful, fruitful for society as a whole. Um, and enjoyable for us here, but but uh, you know, and and sometimes what it is we're talking about very much attracts and repels different kinds of people. And if I'm having a great time talking about the Apple Chapel and the history of computers and just totally geeking out on Jeff Raskin, that's probably a turnoff for a bunch of people that I'm not not aware of, right? Well, let me say, and I see that Stacy has her hand up. And yeah. I really so I want to hear what you have to say, Stacey, but I also feel like I might have put you on the defensive on something that just absolutely did not mean to do it. Well, I'm actually, I'll be quite explicit. Um, I, I think it might have been inspired by reading the overstory, <laughs> reading the research by Susan Simard, um, uh, who had a lovely story about how she worked in the field of forestry and, and timber. I'm not sure if you're aware. Susan Simard wrote the book. Um, yes, that's right. Um, Finding Mother Tree. And so her research has been at the forefront of this um, movement towards a greater understanding of our interconnectedness in life and the, necess the necessity of each part of the ecosystem, right, to fulfill the health of all parts. And I find it really, really important right now. I'm using actually forest bathing, right? And I'm teaching my class, my economics class in, in a little mini forest behind school. And we're talking about the purpose of a tree and how it relates to our personal purpose. And so we can get to the purpose of an economy before we get to its functions and understanding that. And I find it incredibly valuable when we take that larger perspective, find of a tree view. And, and so that, that broader view for me has been really an important one. And I'm finding that I'm concerned about some of the traditional um, mental frames of looking at politics deeply in an agitated way of, oh my God, I can't believe these people are doing that thing. Or looking at climate change. In fact, climate change, if we say climate change, we're automatically in a place of fighting against it. 
proving that it's real still, right? Um, fighting against the forces of it. Um, when it comes to the vaccine thing, it's just, it, it replicates another model of, of this sense of, I know the answer and whoever's not on board with my solution is, is, is misled or stupid or all of these other things. And I find that um, that is an area for me that is of interest. Um, and, and to me, fascinating as well. Stacy, I'll be with you in just a sec. Um, in fact, uh, Stacy, jump in now and then I'll jump in after. Well, I was just going to say, Allison, I support everything you're saying. And I would love to direct you to the call that I had with Jerry yesterday, which is in the generative commons. And I put a comment, which I ended with, I want the idea of, so towards increasing diversity and uh, looking at, instead of looking at the problem, like switching that thinking, what I'd like to see are these beginner mindset calls, which I think will increase that diversity because people come for different reasons and it weaves in the social part of giving your opinion. So for example, um, Jerry, you might be better at explaining what I was talking about yesterday than I would. You're doing great. <laughs> but my interest was really looking at the values that we would want businesses to have. And I particularly, particularly like the idea of looking at what some of the female economists are saying. And I put it in the chat before you got here, um, because I think that one way that will increase diversity is if we invite these women in to give their opinions, not, um, you know, like Jerry had suggested women's issues. I don't go, I don't think that's the way to do it at all. There are not separate issues. I don't want to be talking about women's issues. I want to be talking about life's issues. But to have these beginner calls where people are just getting to know each other, and you don't have to come unless you really want to hang with the people. I see, um, I go to a call because of people there. I want to create a place where I'm going to want to be. I want to learn, but I want to learn with people that I respect. I want to hear. What do you think about this? What do you think about that? I think that after those beginner calls, then you find out who's interested in what because Jerry brings up, oh, this person, you know, this is what's going on here. People can go to that after the call. Somebody else says, we're interested in this. I think that's a, a good way to organize, but to have that center place where it's a, like a meeting hall, but where you're talking about the same topic. And I think, I don't know, I'll, I'll stop here because I don't know if I even addressed the points I wanted, but I everything you said, Allison, I totally support it. I think it's important and I think we can do it. Um, and I'd like to, thank you, Stacey. Um, and I'd like to ask a clarifying question, Allison, which is, um, so there's a way of interpreting what you had said as well, there's just no facts on the ground. We can't agree that anything is actually real, like the threat of something change, like, like human caused anthropogenic uh, climate change, for example, that, that maybe that's not real. We're still trying to prove the case. And then there's a, I wanna tease that apart from how we react to people who say that that's not the case, which is like, oh my God, they're demons, they're horrible. We, we must like stamp them out and like salt the ground that they live on so that they, their, their offspring can never live again. And those two things are like really, really different, but I, it, don't we need to stand on some set of uh, facts or not facts, but in science, there's like closer approximations to truth. It's not science. Good scientists use a method that never says we know, we know how everything works. They say we have a better understanding today than we did yesterday. And here's what that is. And if that gets replaced with a better model tomorrow, we're going to be good with that. Although that may take a generation of scientists to die off who won't who refuse to join the new model. That happens a lot. But 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 don't we need some anchors for what we think is going on, or we don't actually make any progress on the big problems? If we're going to be talking and spending time with anthro whether or not we need to prove that climate change is anthrop anthropogenic, which has been proven as an accepted and we can move forward for those. I mean, what we really wanna 
what we really want to do is regenerate the soils. What we really want to do is um, so many, so many things that move in the right direction. So I wrote in the notes, I mean, my sense of why there's pushback on whether or not um, climate change is anthropogenic is for a very, I mean, I'll say it. I don't know if it, how, how to the truth of, of this, this is where my blame comes in, you know, but why bother? Because I, I think that the libertarian perspective is what is um, really pushing heavily against that claim because it means that therefore that model of my personal merit and my income, my wealth, my whatever is there is, is on the chopping block in order to be taxed and distributed and, and, you know, and ameliorate some of these causes that, and so same thing with the, um, uh, the, what is it, uh, sorry, critical race theory, you know, no, we can't talk about race in schools. We need to make it illegal because uh, what you're saying is that my investments and my, my, my privilege and my meritocracy, again, is on the chopping block in order to be redistributed to make amends for what has happened in the past. But all of these things are, um, we've just got to change it at its core. And uh, there are so many ways to invest, I think, in the solutions and make those attractive solutions. And so when we can focus towards the world that we want to build and make those attractive to everybody and you know, get off of the, well, this, the facts say, we can, can deny the facts until kingdom come. What, and, and there are many, many more facts. There are many more facts. And as do we really think one of the things that Susan Simard had addressed in her book was the perspective of the forestry experts when she was studying forestry. And so we have such a strong sense of the internet has taken us away from um, having any faith in a single singular narrative. And this is such a conservative um, opinion to me. I'm kind of surprised at what's gone on in a progressive because I always was listening to manufacturing consent, you know, and paying attention to, well, what, we have a dominated narrative. Uh, it's very dominated. And so, so we should now listen to the experts when we look at what the experts said here and look at what the experts said here and look at what the experts said here and look at when they messed up here. Look at our human limitations. How much do we insist that we know? Let's go towards what resonates right here as the best possible that we can and try, and try to make that a very attractive pathway. And I just feel that, that the, you know, I have a child who's 13 and, um, and I'm now seen as absolutely selfish, absolutely um, a danger to society because I don't want to vaccinate my son. Now, I'm, I can vaccinate myself because I'm just really beyond that. I'd rather not, to tell you the truth. I'd rather build up the immunity because I don't have full faith, to tell you the truth, that we always know the best way. And I think that I would much rather build up an immunity amongst people and society. And I would much rather build up a healthy um, healthcare system. And that our singular focus on vaccines has definitely detracted from a complexity of solutions on where we could go. So, um, so whatever. But my, my son, I think as a 13 year old, um, that making me um, a pariah to society because I don't want to vaccinate him is kind of an interesting thing. It's kind of an interesting thing. And I just invite um, a little bit of a heightened, a moment of heightened perspective when we're at a critical time. We're at a critical time and the reaction at a critical time and a tense time, if we're feeling upset, by what others are doing with their lives, then we might notice that something's going on with us. And, uh, and, and so I think that that's kind of maybe what was coming up. It's like, I, I just wanted to be frank about that and throw it out to the, to the group for whatever it's worth. Cause I know that there's a, a, um, a strong, um, sense of how is it that people are so misled and getting false information. And here we are in the open global mind and I'm not sure that we all have access to all the 
information. So, thanks. Thanks, Allison. So we're it's, we're trying to get to that to that uh, point. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, it's actually when you when you dive into it, it's actually not complicated to understand. Uh, in I mean, in my sector last year, twenty twenty, uh, commodity growers. 40% of their income was generated by governmental subsidies. They could absolutely not uh, maintain their business model if it wasn't for uh, government funding that is being routed in their direction in, in multiple forms. And, and it's best in, uh, expressed in the Farm Bill, which is up for negotiation in 2022. So we are actually, I, I, I'm partnering with the Kiss the Ground organization, we're mobilizing a group of NGOs to, to understand this and to get into the topics as complicated as it is. But yeah, the, the, this is a food fight, basically. You know, you, you, there are, there are uh, existing uh, power structures. I mean, when you, when you start looking at the way money is being distributed through the government into business channels, it's astounding, not just at the federal level, but also at the state level. Now, and to change that starts with people having to become aware of it and understanding how this money flows, which means you have to cut through the entire media noise. The mass media absolutely avoids those topics because their income, their revenue model is advertising coming from the very people who, whose business model would be harmed you know, by uh, these changes that are, that are coming through. So no, it, it's it's uh, it's a transformative period, and if we get this wrong, I mean, right now Congress is in the process of of passing a three point five trillion dollar bill, you know, and it it's going to go through. It, it there's no there's no choice. But if these investments are misallocated, if they're making assumptions in how to allocate this money, it could absolutely end up uh, catastrophically wrong, right? Because uh, and you know, just staying with agriculture. I mean, if they invest that money in the wrong channels, you know, then then it would it would deepen the the, the problem that we have created in the natural world in the ecosystem. So it's it's just all you can really do at this point is to uh, inform each other, educate each other, you know, stay informed, uh, and and uh, and uh, seek to understand, you know, what are the core issues. Uh, that that drive this uh, discussion. Thanks, Klaus. Um, one of one of my wishes for OGM and OGM conversations is to slow down these conversations some, which I'm not good at. I'm certainly not good at on Thursday calls because we're busy, in, you know, throwing a whole bunch of different links and things, and we switch. And and because it's a check-in format, we move from person to person. We switch contexts a lot, and we sort of jump around a lot, but. But on the question you just raised, Allison, I'd love to just slow it down to find out specifically um, what are the reasons, what are the objections, what are the thoughts, how does it work? Uh, and, then, and then from my perspective, map this out in some sense so that we can say, okay, here are the five reasons or here are the 12 reasons or whatever. And then just slow down and look at one at a time and go, you know, how does this work and what's going on around it? And I think, I think that um, uh, the Navy SEALs like to say, uh, Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Um, and I think that kind of goes for conversation too, for meaningful conversation, is that when we can slow things down and take and, and respectfully sort of take our time with, with the issues, uh, that might work out well. So I think, um, I think um, there's, uh, there's reason for us to maybe set up another call or like certainly pop-up calls, but maybe some other rhythm so to, to take things a little slower a question at a time and say, okay, this call is only going to be about this one question. And we're going to unpack it. We're going to sort of go over it. We're going to try to figure it out from different perspectives and model the different perspectives. I think that'd be really useful for us. Um, so thank you for bringing all that into the conversation. Um, let's go Pete, Mark, Ingrid. Um, thank you, Jerry. Um, thank you, Allison. Uh, lots of uh, great stuff, I think. Thank you, and we need it in the conversation. Um, I'm gonna hit return on my Mattermost chat, and then I'll try to copy that over um, to Zoom chat. So Thanks. on my mind this week, um, 
uh, I've been playing around with a clean NFT marketplace, um, and that led me to play around with uh, decentralization technologies. Uh, so um, IPFS has been interesting to play with, and um, Matrix, uh, which is a kind of decentralized um, chat infrastructure, um, has been interesting. Um, Massive Wiki is going pretty well, actually. Um, I had a great call yesterday with the FedWiki folks, um, and um, there's other cool stuff going on with Massive Wiki. Uh, Development-wise, we've kind of slowed down a little bit, and um, a few of us, uh, Bill and especially Wendy Alford, have been really digging in on how you how you start to Wiki. Um, uh, Winnie is using herself as a test subject, and she drags somebody else uh, into the into the fray. Um, uh, smart person, lots of information all over the place. How do you actually like slow down enough uh, to start using um, Massive Wiki to keep track of all of that stuff? So we're learning a lot, and and uh, hopefully at some point we'll feed that back into um, software and and process and documentation and and uh, screencasts and things like that. Um, California recall election was really scary uh, before it happened, and then it was um, we spent, you know, uh, 275 million dollars on that um, afterwards. Um, so it's been interesting watching the people kind of react to that. Um, uh, and especially some of the people watching the media react to it. Um, uh, I, I remember it's like, oh my gosh, there's this polarization in California. It was crazy. You know, there's a whole bunch of people who wanted uh, Newsom, our governor, out. A whole pe bunch of people had done. And it's like, dude, look at the, the election. It was, you know, a route. It was, you know, 70 plus to 30. Um, it, it wasn't, you know, California is not divided over this. this. Um, and if you're reporting it as if it is, then you know, then there's kind of a problem, which is not to say that that the United States doesn't have this weird rift that's being driven by, um, um, you know, by structural forces, I think, but um, I'm still freaked out about how our culture is sending kids to school in the middle of a pandemic uh, without enough protection or um, ways to manage, um, manage that. Um, um, Glad my kids are grown and, and on their own and making their own decisions. Um, uh, Allison, uh, interestingly enough, I was um, I was heavily into alternative health uh, uh, before we had kids and when we had our first kid. Uh, so our first kid went to a naturopath um, for years um, and didn't get any shots, none none of the ones that people go, oh, well, COVID is one thing, but then there's mumps and measles and rubella and all that kind of stuff. You take those, right? And we actually didn't. Um, so I kind of feel for you. Um, uh, and then there's a, a short but sweet uh, conversation that Rob started uh, in Tools and Technology about um, drawing and capturing ideas and linking them together. Um, uh, perennial you know, age old discussion, um, you know, what tools, what tools are you using that isn't a whiteboard because a whiteboard isn't practical for everything. And, you know, you get the regular suspects and, and then we kind of wring our hands and like, I wish it were better. Um, so I don't know exactly what to report out of that, but uh, it's cool to see that happening. And, and um, Rob and I had some interesting exchanges back and forth. That's me, thanks. Thanks, Pete. Um... Lots of good stuff. And of course, the, the why don't we draw stuff and share stuff better question is big for us and, and like we care a lot about it, as well as like all these, how do we make social decisions together um, stuff. Oh, good. There's your, there's your list. Um, also, Pete and I uh, added a couple pages to the Open Global Mind uh, website. So there's now uh, Vincent and his Trove system are now visible on our website with a calendar, a list of members, of people involved in OGM who are registered on Trove uh, and a list of projects that are related to uh, OGM that are listed on Trove. So I put in the Mattermost channel uh, a link to, you can go create your own profile and we won't use this call to do it, but I think at some point we'll do a walkthrough with, with uh, some, somebody who isn't on it yet. We'll just do a screen share and a walkthrough on a different call uh, and just get more of us in there because we've been looking for 18 months to, to see ourselves like, hey, who's in this group? And this is a really lovely way to do that. So thank you, Vincent, uh, for building the platform and offering it up 
to us for service. And uh, we'll put the link in the in the chat to uh, for that invite to go build a profile on Trove. Uh, and now let's go Mark Ingrid Michael. Hello. Yo. It is Mexican Independence Day. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, I was walking through the forest talking to my cousin, and we were it's talking about our Mexican family and basically how, you know, all this shit goes down with, uh, you know, Mexicans in California. And, uh, you know, I can pass for white. I can pass for male. I can pass for old. <laughs> hey, Father Hidalgo on uh, 16 de septiembre uh, basically declared independence from Spain oh, back in the 1800s. So, hey, I'll come down a tiny bit. And oh, slow down a lot because in terms of blame, it's all my fault. You did the whole it's thing. It's me. Yep, it's it's all me. I I it's you know, I was watching the OGM um build OGM call from last week and I didn't get enough sleep. And I came into work and I released some code at the Internet Archive. And I brought down you know, part of the Internet Archive. So I'm not Please. blaming Jerry or Pete for their excellent, you know, back and forth about basically how we can frame a global memory, a global kind of thinking um, together that kept me up at night. I couldn't, you know, I took a shower. I drank some tea. Um, if I had dope, I should have smoked it, but I didn't, um, or as we say, marijuana. Um, but, um, you know, I, I released some code and uh, walked home, you know, through the forest. Um, there's a forest in between where I live and where I work. It's called Golden Gate Park. Um, there's some redwoods there. There's a linear microforest along Park Presidio. That's beautiful. But, um, but basically, yes. Um, uh, the Internet Archive searching went down because of me, um, because I didn't get enough sleep and I wasn't thinking. Uh, and Eric, um, there is a uh, D-Web meetup um, that the Internet Archive hosts um, and have hosted uh, D-Web conferences. We hope to get back to that um, before um, uh, everybody dies from uh, whatever we're all going to die from. Um, so what I'm going to keep broadening. Right? Yes, yes. The menu keeps happening. It's like asteroids. Uh, so what I have been thinking about um, is planes um, with writing or graphics on them. And these planes can shift. Well, they have limits to where they can shift. So you can't. So if you have a plane on a, uh, what is it? Um, a monitor with text on it, you can't like reverse it so the text goes backwards. You can do that to an image, but you kind of, you know, there's that cover flow idea where, you know, you kind of move pages before, but what if you could kind of, you know, move your perspective um, point of vanishing so that you can, yeah, it's basically, it's, it's the start of a, um, bringing 3d into text and image um but you know never um yeah just just at the beginning i mean uh i'm really interested in julian gomez's work um and i just don't have the time um i try to i mean i'm a better designer than a coder but i'm not in a design role that's kind of a a tough thing um because there's politics wherever you go. I mean, the Internet Archive is an enlightened, wonderful kind of uh, bringer of as much knowledge as we can, storing it forever for free on the Internet, backing up the Internet, you know, uh, putting books out there. And I wrote that I, you know, my role there is kind of like a bit slave. We're, we're, we're better, I guess, a bit wage slave. And making transformative change even in a transformative organization damn that's hard and i love 
Kevin Kelly's notion and and what Pete was mentioning that you know to basically create these abilities to work together it takes human time it takes biological time not internet time not you know enlightened little tech shit time if you'll excuse my french um but you know there's people who are just like we got to rush we got to do all this stuff you know we got to earn all our money while we're uh, in our twenties, and and um, I don't know, um, it's kind of uh, um, slow practice. To practice slowness is infuriating at times, as I'm sure you're now infuriated at me for bringing. Bob and Ray and the slow talkers of America. And um, I was hoping to hear from Mark uh, Tebow. I, I don't know if he passed or. He did. Or you, oh, okay. So um, that's it. Um, basically, you know, I reached 15 million uh, connections in between the two and a half million um unique strings of text in my uh, external mind, the MX project that I work on and have been attempting to get out since 1984 uh, patiently. And, um, you know, slowness uh, furthers apparently, um, at least in some of the um, I Ching hexagrams, um, but other hexagrams might, you know, say blame Mark for not having a global intelligence network of idea sharing. It is my fault, and I'll, I'll pass it to uh, whoever's next. Oh, and uh, I am taking live notes within um, the MX system, and I'm posting them to the, to the Mattermost. I try to do that every half an hour, but um, yeah, it's tough. Anyway. Um, love to hear from Mark in the future, <laughs> and and we'll try to get together. Um, and and Julian, I, it's just I just owe you the effort to try and connect with you, and I'm sorry, it's my fault. Um, Mr. Carranza, thank you so much for for singing and dancing for us. That is like much appreciated. Uh, in sympathy with slowness, I put the Bureau of Mammal Affairs, uh, sorry, the Department of Mammal Vehicles behind me, which is in the movie Zootopia, where the sloths are at the desk, which is like one of the world's best scenes in animation. When uh, Judy uh, Hop, what's her name? Judy Hops, what's her last, I've forgotten. The, the, the protagonist of Zootopia is a little bunny who's really fast, who's trying to get some data really fast, and the sloths are not quick. Anyway, um, I can put a link to that in the chat. Let's go, uh, we're, we're close to the end of our 90 minutes, but uh, we have Ingrid, Michael, Vincent, Julian, and then we're wrapped. So Ingrid, please. Hey guys, so the last month I've been, uh, I did a bit of the Camino. I did 277 kilometers, which is not the whole thing, but hey, it was really amazing. You mean you were this, on the Camino? Yeah, yeah, I walked the Camino. Yeah, in a- uh, El Camino Real? <laughs> El otro. Ah. <laughs> Santiago, <laughs> my friend, mi amigo. Um, but, uh, uh, just a just a quick thing about it is uh, I was a complete skeptic. Um, I just thought, why not? I've heard about it all my life. I'll just go check it out. But it is truly magical, and it it is weirdly powerful. And I can't explain. No one can explain it unless you've been on it. But I would just say to anyone, if you're called to do it, and I'm not a religious person at all, um, that uh, you should go and experience it. I would highly recommend it. Um, the other crazy thing that happened to me after that and why I cut it short actually is because um, I was invited to go to a conference with uh, people who are doing village building all over the world. So it was a lot of, um, I didn't know what I was in for, let's put it that way, it was in Portugal. And um, someone that I've been talking to through someone that I met in this group in a very roundabout way invited me and said, come on down, we really like your idea. You can meet a lot of interesting people here. And boy, did I. 
I can just tell you there was every kind of person there. And, but for some reason, and this must be some universal life lesson for me, I ended up meeting a lot of people who are, um, uh, let's say they made a lot of money in crypto. They want to go live back on the land and in nature, but they're also, um, and this speaks a little bit to what you're saying, Allison, they are um, really do not believe that uh, vaccination is necessary. Um, they believe in a lot of conspiracy theories. These were sort of people I thought were my peers. Um, I even heard QAnon theories. I, I have to say my head was blown. I, I did not know that people sort of that were really well educated, that were came from very privileged backgrounds, that had traveled around the world, had these ideas um, and are in quite powerful spheres, let's put it that way. So um, I just have to share that I, that was honestly um, kind of a scary moment for me. And I thought, have I missed an entire, because I live in my little bubble, bubble in Amsterdam in Europe. I'm not living in America. Um, I don't, had never met a QAnon. I didn't really even know. I tried not to know about it. So um, I don't know what all of you think about this and it probably doesn't even matter, but um, I think there is a lot more going on out there than we maybe in our bubbles know about. And um, yeah, I don't know what to think about it. I, uh, uh, yeah, I'm just sharing that. So um, uh, yeah, so the other thing is uh, it, it kind of made me think, um, well, look, I've got this project. I do, I want, I want to start, um, you know, it's not a village, but I want to start a program that integrates a lot of things that sort of these kinds of people would be involved in, but I cannot partner with people who believe in these gigantic conspiracy theories. I'm just going to be honest here. I'm very science and fact-based. You know, it felt like very much hitting the WeWork world of that guy who started WeWork and made so much money and never was prosecuted and now is, you know, like multi multi millionaire and yet sort of had this whole pyramid scheme. So, and I don't know what you guys think about that either, but um, yeah, anyway, so I'm a little bit disillusioned at this point. Um, I'm gonna try and keep the faith that there are, you know, other types of VCs out there <laughs> um, and I'm sure there are, but anyway, so that was my, that was my crazy month. <laughs> and that's where I am right now trying to figure out sort of what my next steps are and um, and where to go from here. Uh, Ingrid, I do believe you've given Mark <laughs> a run for the money on the check-in of the day award. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, like had you added like a musical number, you would have totally been over the top and blown him out of the waters. But but thank you for that. That's um, it's really interesting. And I think you're just des you're describing the waters we're all swimming in in some sense. And I, I don't know that we understand what to do and how to behave. And I think that's like really great territory for us to turn over uh, to do stuff in. So thank you for that. Um, we had a few people in the queue, Michael, Vincent, Julian. Um, I'll refrain from grabbing an instrument and uh, um, rising to the challenge. So this will not be the check-in of the day. Um, I was, um, you know, one thing I wanted to share that, that was is similar to a, a share I gave after attending the Mozilla Festival um, that relates to diversity and sort of outward um, radiation of the OGM group. Um, I apologize in advance. I mean, I apologize in the past tense, actually, for not um, alerting people to it. But I had on my calendar yesterday and stumbled into, without much expectation, the Responsible Tech Summit. I don't know if anybody else here was um, part of that. It was co-presented by All Tech is Human and The Bridge. Um, and it was a really impressive gathering of people, you know, talking about ethics and tech and, you know, from a number of different perspectives. And while I was just checking, um, 
see. Uh, um, there's the link to the event. Um, and they usually uh, put things in. Actually, I think that's the, the link to their, um, their live stream series where the current, um, the current event um, is not yet up but will be soon. It's long, um, has a bunch of different panels, but it's very cool. And it did strike me that there were a lot of groups there that were mentioned, um, that were aligned, that, you know, have me feeling like, you know, we need, we're great people, we don't have, a patent on the stuff that we're going after and um, participating in those other groups and possibly sponsoring panels or presentations that bring other people in with respect, not saying, hey, come participate in our group where you're gonna feel marginal um, and and see a bunch of people who aren't diverse, you know, talking in a very familiar way with each other, um, but rather, hey, you know, you've got something to say, we'd like to put you on the podium, um, invite other people, have other people come in. Jerry, this may relate to your, you know, show um, notion, but, I think a sort of stalking horse for that might be to do some Zoom events or, or air meet events or something where we can, we can bring people in. Um, and I think if you guys check out that, uh, that event, you'll see a lot of candidates for people that we could listen to rather than help. Um, which, you know, I think is, is a term that comes up, you know, like, what can we do to help others? Well, I mean, maybe we can just listen. <laughs> Thanks, that's, that's my share. Thanks, Michael. Listening was actually super helpful and is probably our first step in all cases, or most cases anyway, and there's not enough listening going on. Thank you. Um, we had a Vincent Julian Doug. Um, Jerry, why is the DMV in the background of your... <laughs> it's the Department of Mammal Vehicles, and we were talking earlier about slowing conversations down. So Pete posted the scene in the chat from Zootopia, where Judy Hopp runs up needing a plate run from the DMV clerks who are sloths. So it's, it's you know, we're opaque, obscure, we like strange references. It's, it's, it's how we roll. Okay, I was that makes more sense. The actual DMV is like the worst place on earth. So I was <laughs> actually my last visits to DMVs were actually really satisfying. It took no time to get to the counter and I was boom, boom out of there. But that's just me. And, and Eric has gone with a full bore Apple II background. It's awesome. Like every, every, every low pixel art. Sorry, Vincent, to interrupt you, but keep going. <laughs> no problem. Um, so my check in. Um, I had a really interesting um, debate last night with um, uh, two friends, uh, one of which is a hardcore like Trump supporter. And, um, and then I, I just, re I'm realizing like, and this is kind of touching on some of the previous check-ins about the vaccine is um, I could go up to someone who's like fervently against the vaccine and have a, a two hour debate telling them all the reasons why they're wrong <laughs> or why there's flaws in their thinking and why uh, there's some misinformation or logical fallacy and be arguing the from the side of like why we should get vaccines or, or why an individual should in some certain context, um, right? Because it's different for age groups or for situations. Um, and then at, and then I can also turn to somebody who's like super for the vaccine in every single context and then have a similar two hour debate 
debunking misinformation and also being and so like it's it's like weird that like I can kind of in different situations basically have a really heated two-hour discussion with people on both sides and it makes it even harder for me to have a actual (laughs) opinion on what to do because it feels like there's just so much to be able to um weed through to find that middle ground um I feel like uh, on top of it all is like the dynamic nature, like the virus is mutating as our conversations are mutating about it. Um, I'll stop there. Cause I know there's only a few minutes left. Um, my last other piece is I'm going to be um, away for the next kind of few weeks. So I might not be as present um, next week. I'm going to be in Prague at a um, design sprint working on a um, currency system for eco villages um, to help communities cool. be able to um, share resources and um, with each other. So it's kind of instead of like a person to person, it's more of like a community to community currency system. Um, and so I'm going to be working on that for a week. And then I have like three weddings <laughs> the, the following three weekends. So one of them is in Prague. And so I'm going to be like pretty crazy, but um, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun to be social again. And it's also going to be quite scary. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's my check-in. That sounds awesome, Vincent. I, 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 can we follow your trail on Insta or Twitter? Or are you going to like put your put your your moves on the socials so we can vicariously enjoy your travels you know i don't do much of that anymore but i will post my um my instagram link if uh if anyone's interested <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Awesome. yeah thank you it'd be fun because you're going you're going to be doing fun fun stuff um let's go julian doug i actually don't have much of a check-in because this week has been one of those mostly zoom meetings and in fact, my attendance here this morning has been fractured because the kitten's been particularly rambunctious this morning. But uh, <laughs> next week, I will have some more. Are you wearing like heavy trousers so that the like little claws don't get all the way through and tear your calves open or? Yes, I call them my climbing pants, not because I go climbing, but because my kitten climbs me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Nothing like, like young pets with sharp teeth and sharp claws. He's so cute uh, though. Yeah. Um, uh, Doug, you're, uh, we made it through everybody and the uh, uh, floor is yours. Yeah, a few seconds to be slow. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can take your time. We, we, we will go over as long as we need to at this point. Or we're good. Well, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on, on slowness, I've been reading a good book called Slow Writing by a woman named DeSalvo. And it's re- much, much better than you would think from the title. Uh, It's very encouraging to slow down thinking, not in a Daniel Kahneman way, but in a much more humane way. Uh, The writing is good. The examples are good. It's fun to to read. And it's affected my writing. So that's been good. Uh, On two other things on check-in, I found myself this week reading Arnold Toynbee, whom I haven't heard a reference to for a long time. And his analysis of the collapse of, com- of societies, of civilizations, just feels to me like it's right on for what we need to know now. And the writing is crystal clear. It's uh, extremely helpful. Uh, last point, I was late today because I was in a meeting with a group of people from Africa and Los Angeles who are connecting communities together in eco-villages. And boy, was it stimulating to be with people who think differently than the way I do. Uh, it was just really a complete delight. delight. Anyway, that's it. Any, do you want any highlights of like the other, other thinkers or other ideas that, that stood out for you? Well, uh, people with a, a depth of experience uh, and interest that was just beyond what I expected. Uh, there were a few ex-ambassadors from Af- African countries. Uh, there were people from villages and people from Los Angeles, and they're all working together, all, mostly uh, from the Afro-American community. Uh, but it was just a delight to be with them. Sounds awesome. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, 
Eric, I'm not sure we have time for a screen share, alas, but uh, I'd love to see some of that. And you shared, we should be, uh, Pete, I think, found one of your YouTube videos and added that to the chat. Um, and maybe we can drop that into one of our next check-ins or something like that. But thanks for joining us here. Sure. Thank you. Awesome. Um, everybody, thank you. Um, much to think about, much to do. Really appreciate your presence very, very much. See you on the inner tubes and in the DMV. <laughs> <laughs>